form with the Honorable Mary C. Noble. This issue is the subject of a report produced by the Commonwealth Institute for Policy Issues and Civic Engagement, which is an arm of the Women's Network. Over a year ago, the Women's Network and Together Frankfurt co-sponsored a public forum on this issue. Secretary Noble was going to appear as a follow-up program, but COVID intervened. Tonight, the two sponsoring organizations are finally going to have that program. And we are supported by two other groups who share our interests, Moms Demand Action and Focus on Race Relations, known as FOUR. It's a privilege to hear from Secretary Noble, head of the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. She comes with outstanding credentials to take on the job to which Governor Bashir appointed her almost a year and a half ago, although I'm sure it seems longer to her. Secretary Noble served 10 years on the Kentucky Supreme Court, retiring in 2016. She was a judge with the Fayette County Circuit Court, and she was in private law practice for nine years. She has seen the justice system from many perspectives. Secretary Noble, we are so looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> this type of forum, I have to admit, is my very favorite. And I'm not sure Barbara knows what she's done by just unleashing me to talk to you <laughs> tonight. This has been a real difficult thing to arrange. Uh, we started talking about this over a year ago. I was a very new secretary at the time. I had a lot to learn. I've learned a lot in the ensuing year. And, and I tell people all the time, there's a reason that procrastination continues. It's because sometimes you get good results. And if you wait long enough, sometimes you get more information. There's more to tell folks. And that's probably the case here tonight. With a year and a half under our belt, we are able to tell you more about what we're doing, tell you more about quote, reforms, and also to answer questions that you might have from things that you've read about or heard about lately to the extent I can. But I'm going to take a little bit of speaker's license. This is billed as talking about criminal justice reform. And some of you had already sent in some questions that you were interested in having answered. And one of those questions, I don't know who it came from, but it was a really good question. It was, what can we do? How can we, what can you do to better educate the public about the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet and all the departments that are in it? So all these things we wanna talk about tonight, how we might wanna change sentencing, what are the laws that affect incarceration? All these things that we might be interested in discussing will make a lot more sense if we put them in a framework and understand how this cabinet works. And so I'm gonna start by educating you, trying to answer the request in that question about the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. I'm gonna tell you things that I think people just don't know. One of the things is that this is an extremely large cabinet. There are over 7,300 employees in this cabinet and we operate on a 1.3 billion, that is billion dollar budget. You know, I was a circuit judge, I was on the Supreme Court. We had nothing to do with anything like that, managing that level of money or that many employees. There's not that many employees in the entire court system. That number of employees, that size budget is larger, is greater than many of the corporations that exist in this country. And it brings with it all of the management problems, all of the issues of employees that you have that are a part of functioning as the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. Then the cabinet itself is a very complex cabinet. You know, when I first started reviewing exactly what made up the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet, I sort of did a step back and I thought, this, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Because we have actually six agencies or groups known as departments within the cabinet, and they are really quite disparate. The first one I will mention is the office of the secretary or what we call the justice admin office. That office has a little over hundred employees in it. And its job is to oversee the administration 
of the other departments in the cabinet. Nobody ever hears about us. We're just administrators, worker bees, keeping, keeping everybody else functioning and moving. But what you hear about in the press are the other departments. Let me start by mentioning the one that I think everybody hears about the most, and that's the Department of um, Corrections. In Kentucky, the Department of Corrections is a very large department. We have a high demand for corrections workers at each of our institutions, for food service workers, and for healthcare workers. We also have had in the past a large number of prisoners. And when those prisoners are placed into the custody of the state, the state has legal obligations toward those prisoners that, they, that it is required to meet. So it takes a lot of people to manage that. We have 14 prisons that are operating in the state of Kentucky now. They are scattered across the state in every region. One of them is devoted exclusively to women, the Kentucky Correctional Institution for Women. The rest of them are all male, or in the case of the Western Kentucky Correctional Institution, there is a small unit there called Rosh Cash that also has women prisoners at it, but a very small number. The rest of them are male prisoners throughout the state. These 14 correctional institutions are in varying states of functionality as far as the buildings go. Some of them are very old, such as the Kentucky State Reformatory, or the Kentucky State Prison in far western Kentucky, those that were built with the Works uh, Progress Administration or some even a little bit before that time, back in the Roosevelt era. Some of them are much newer. What that gives us is a management issue on the space inside these institutions that range from open concept to single prisoner cells at some of the prisons. It makes each prison itself a sort of a world unto itself that has certain management requirements that are somewhat dictated by the physical structure of the prison. Despite that, there are generalized rules and principles and laws that apply across the board to all of the prisoners. Currently, we are facing an employee shortage. We had it actually before COVID hit, but COVID has been an extraordinary measure for us to face. It's changed the way we function, it's changed the way we think, and we've had to come up with resources and directions that never crossed anybody's mind because we do have lives in our keeping. So the Department of Corrections basically houses those people that have been sentenced by a court to serve a period of time in incarceration. We also have a juvenile version of that, the Department of Juvenile Justice. The, the Department of Juvenile Justice is, of course, for juveniles. And since uh, 2016, there has been a significant change in the law affecting juveniles with the advent of Senate Bill 200, which was a reworking of the Juvenile Code. When that bill was passed, we had and have now approximately 15 housing units or incarceration units, if you want to describe them that way, a number of group homes, day treatment centers, and other things that we use to treat juveniles. But Senate Bill 200, which focused on keeping kids in the community, has been extremely successful so that the population count that is actually institutionalized now is much lower and smaller than it has ever been. But it is another department that we have that does house people in the, in the buildings and institutions that we have there. All of them are considerably newer than the institutions that the many of the institutions we have at the Department of Corrections because we haven't actually had a Department of Juvenile Justice that long. I was appointed, uh, I believe by Governor Patton to serve on the first Juvenile Justice Advisory Board. So that kind of dates how long the Department of Juvenile Justice has been around. Those are our two housing departments or institutionalized departments where we actually keep persons whose freedom has been restricted. We have another department known as the Department of Criminal Justice Training. And let me tell you, this is a big surprise. 
to almost everybody to hear about this. Kentucky leads the nation in our training of law enforcement. You might find that um, amazing, and it is, but it's true. And we've done so for a number of years now. Every law enforcement officer in the state of Kentucky is required by statute to re receive certification and to be certified by the Department of Criminal Justice Training. They all must take a 20 to 22 week training course before they are certified to carry weapons and to carry out the necessary law enforcement duties. This is a model for the country and the world. It's something that's amazing. There is a large campus that's located um, adjacent to Eastern Kentucky University um, in uh, Madison County. And we cycle through class after class after class of local law enforcement officers. They're being trained in all types of proper police procedures. They have done an incredibly good job over the years, not without problems. We've had some as we find them, we admit them, we correct them and we prevent them from happening in the future. That's the approach that this administration has taken and that the cabinet has taken to issues that have arisen. In addition to the Department of Criminal Justice training, law enforcement itself is also housed in the, in, uh, the, in the justice cabinet. And that is the Kentucky State Police. That is another one of our agencies or departments and everybody knows who the Kentucky State Police are. Their mission is to do general policing anywhere within the state of Kentucky. They have jurisdiction anywhere within the state of Kentucky. We give deference to local law enforcement, but Kentucky State Police can operate anywhere within the state of Kentucky. There has been a proud tradition in the Kentucky State Police, but policing in general has come under question for processes and attitudes this past year more than it ever has in our history and not without merit. And so we are doing some self-examination. We are looking at how to change our culture and re-educating all of our officers going forward. And finally, and this is perhaps the oddest mix of the group, finally in the Justice Cabinet, we also have the Department of Public Advocacy which is the litigation group that defends um, accused persons who are indigent or unable to pay for their own defense. Incredibly necessary, incredibly important. And the work that they do is very devoted, very energized toward ensuring prisoners' rights, actually not prisoners at that point, defendants' rights in their trials once they've become accused of a crime and then on appeal once they have been convicted and are placed in our institutions. Sometimes that seems like it's an odd mix when I'm having a cabinet meeting. When you have people from the Department of Public Advocacy across the table from, let's say, a state police person that might have arrested a defendant that somebody in the department is defending. But it is all about the process of justice, and it has all sides and aspects to it that are controlled by our statutes, our constitution, and the precedent of our case law. So it's very important that we're reminded what the law is in our administration of these functions of the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. Now, those six departments work with a certain amount of unity because they're administered by the Justice Admin Office. And also because Governor Bashir requires it, he requires transparency, adherence to the law, cooperation with local governments. And that has been a mantra and a policy that we've followed throughout this whole year. So it is a very large cabinet. It has some broad mandates about what it's supposed to do. And it also is a cabinet that addresses many, many, many specific issues. And I, I won't mistake this. It was a huge learning curve for me to learn how each of these departments function to learn how I had to coordinate between these departments and what we had to do as matters of policy and law was uh, required a fast learn. But I have an excellent 
uh, staff that buckled down. We've learned it. We feel like we're in a very good position that we know where we are and what we're doing and that everybody is cooperative within the department. Now, some of the questions that were sent to me early have dealt more specifically with the Department of Corrections. And I think maybe, uh, Barbara, at this point, having laid out what we are and what we do, it might be good if you just kind of guide this. Uh, you gave me about 10 or 15 minutes for the overview, and then we would go to questions and discuss those things. I'll start with one that was submitted. What are the consequences of mass incarceration in Kentucky? According to the Prison Policy Initiative, Kentucky's mass incarceration rate outpaces that of the U.S., which outpaces that of every other NATO country. How did Kentucky get here, and how does Kentucky change that devastating profile? Okay, let me start by uh, saying a couple of things that are just really important for everybody to hold in mind. You know, when I was working on my master's in psychology, I had to take a course called statistics. And there I learned this phrase, there are statistics and there are damned statistics. <laughs> and I wanna say that sometimes the numbers that you hear are of the second category. Let me begin by saying that the phrase mass incarceration is absolutely misleading. We do not mass incarcerate. That is not to say we don't have a lot of prisoners. We do, let me talk to you about that and tell you what some of those numbers are. Our capacity in the state prisons, now I'm not talking about jails, just the state prisons, is 12,225 persons. Today, as of today, we have 9,800 people incarcerated in our prisons. We do have some vacant beds in our prisons, and I'm gonna to explain to everybody what those are, how they occur, and why it looks like there's a big vacancy when there really isn't. But if you look at the population of Kentucky, the population of Kentucky is about 4.4 million right now. Between what we have incarcerated in the jails, which is, um, I've got a number for that here too, it's 5,000 and something, and those that we have that are in the institutions, we have 15,162 people incarcerated in the state of Kentucky. It's tempting to look at that number and say that's mass incarceration, but that's a very loose word of the use of mass, of the word mass. That is actually less than half a percent of our population. That is not to downplay that that is a large number. And part of that is because Kentucky is a state that has favored a hard law and order history. When I was first starting in as a circuit judge back in 1996, uh, or not at 92, in about 1996, I wanted to do something that nobody heard of before. I wanted to start, and I did, a program called Drug Courts. And everybody said, oh, you want to be soft on crime. Because what the phrase was at that time was, let's be tough on crime. My response was, why don't we try to be smart on crime? And I did say that back then, and it's the catchphrase. Now let's be smart on crime. Because it's the reality about what we need to do. But that led to a lot of legislation in the 90s that has really given large sentences for offense levels in Kentucky. We have our uh, violent offender statute that increases the sentences. We have the uh, repeat offenders that get their sentences enhanced. We've got at least two different ways to enhance the sentences of persons that are convicted in Kentucky. What that has done is it's increased the number of people that we have in our prisons probably more than other states may have because they don't have as strict, I've been known to call them draconian, they don't have as strict a sentencing law as Kentucky does. So while our number is more than we would like to see in an institution, it is currently less than it was when this administration began. And we all know why that is. It's because of COVID. It's because Governor Bashir granted clemency to almost 1,800 people. It's because the courts have been essentially closed and have not been sentencing 
and adding new people in. What we have in our uh, prisons now with that capacity of 12,225 is that there are about 3,217 total beds that don't have a body in them. And someone asked the question, well, if that's the case, why do we have people in the jails? And I'll just keep talking until you tell me you want me to stop. But the number that we have in the jails, a big part of that number is there because they are required to be there by law. Anyone that is sentenced to a class D felony or a class C felony that has a sentence of five years is required to serve their time in a local county jail. Why? Because at the end of the 90s, in the early 2000s, we were running out of bed space in our prisons because of Kentucky sentencing policies. And so statute, statutes were enacted that put those two classes of offenders serving their sentences in local county jails. And that is a good chunk, about 3,012 people are serving in the county jails. But there are about 2,000 or so people also in the county jails that we call controlled intake who have been sentenced and have not yet been moved into an institution. There are many reasons for that. One of the reasons right now is COVID. Because of the COVID situation, we delayed moving um, people from outside into the institution. We're a congregate setting. It's a dangerous setting. And I think someone later on has asked a question about Kentucky's response to that. Uh, it's exceedingly dangerous. And so we've delayed moving some of those in rather than doing the transport problem. But also because when we bring people into the prisons, and this is what people don't know and don't understand, it's maybe a little insider information. You, can, you don't just stick a body in a prison bed somewhere. They're brought to a processing center, their history is analyzed, their record, their, their personal lifestyle, things that their education levels, and they are then classified and they will be placed into one of four classifications. Community, which is a very minimum security level. They're people that live outside the, are housed outside the prison wall that often work in the communities. Minimum security, medium security, and maximum security. Different prisons have a different level of inmate that they house based on the prison and the security level of the prison. So if you have someone sitting in the prison that needs to be in a minimum security prison and there is no bed at a minimum security prison, we can't move them until there is a bed or a space for them. We have worked on that in Kentucky and as a matter of fact, just this year, we opened a new prison in Eastern Kentucky called Southeast Correctional Complex. It's in Wheelwright, Kentucky. It'll hold around 700 prisoners when it's fully, fully uh, occupied. We're working on filling that up as we go now. So the question about mass incarceration needs to be put in perspective that it's not as massive as people tend to say it is, which is not to say it's not more than we need. And what are we doing to reduce it? There's been a lot of litigation that has allowed for earlier uh, for shortening sentences by taking courses and training for earlier returns to the community through the reentry programs. And we continue to work on the legislature to try to get them to reduce some of the sentencing levels. And there was some good legislation this time that, that did affect that sentencing level. I'll stop right there and, and see if that answered the question for you, Barbara. That answers several questions that were submitted, actually, which is good. Uh, Karen, do you have some that have been posted uh, tonight? Yes, we have seven questions that were posted, and they're all really good, and the secretary's touched on some of them, and we'll try to get to all of these, I think. Uh, the first question is from Faith Kemper, and, um, and this is an issue that came up several times, I know, not just something that uh, Faith has brought up here. Um, she volunteered with the Legal Campaign Center after last year after getting ex-felons, um, working to get ex-felons registered to vote. Many of them had to file paperwork instead of doing it electronically. 
And uh, she made numerous attempts to contact someone in the governor's office to encourage the governor to go ahead and sign these, but uh, didn't hear whether or not they were signed prior to election day. Can that process be improved or streamlined in some way? It was a campaign promise of Governor Bashir's that he would restore the voting rights of people who had paid their penalty. And the first job he gave me was to get to work on that. That was a much tougher job than you thought because there were over 100,000 people that were um, uh, appropriate for this limited pardon so that they could resume their voting rights. You had to find them. We didn't have addresses on them. So we worked as hard as we could to come up with a process that would help us find who we could find and would help them find us if they couldn't. We worked with various advocacy groups around the state who helped us get the word out and get people registered. It was a huge effort by the Department of Corrections. The staff did an incredibly good job and we registered a lot of people and are continuing to register a lot of people because as long as this executive order stays in place, which it will, as long as Governor Bashir is governor, unless the legislature decides to enact it into law, which would be great, but they haven't yet. As long as this executive order stays in place, as a person completes the service of their sentence and returns to community, we are giving those people that are leaving complete information and documents that tell them what they need to do to register to vote. Now, the process that's been described in this question, honestly, I, I don't know about that. I've never heard that particular part because Governor Bashir is not signing documents individually for every one of these persons. There was an enacted executive order, and then you go to your local um, county clerk's office and you register to vote with the documentation that you can get from the Department of Corrections that says that you are qualified uh, and have served your sentence and are registered or to register to vote. So to my knowledge, that process has been working very well. There, we keep it posted on our website so that people can deal with it. And there are people who have as part of their jobs, the ongoing duty of responding to request about this. So if there has been a problem with someone recently unable to get themselves registered, then whatever that process is, if you all would, whoever's dealing with it, would put it in writing and send it to the attention of me or to the commissioner of the Department of Corrections, Commissioner Cookie Cruz. We'll follow up on it and see what, whether the problem's on our end, because we believe that we're doing everything we can on our end to see that people that have served their time are able to return to the voting rights of the citizen that they are. Did that answer the question, Barbara? Uh, your mic's off, I think. Yes. Okay. There you yes. go. Yeah, I've got it on now. Um, another question that was submitted. Many people believe that we keep our communities safer by putting more people in prison. Do you think that the prison reforms that are being proposed would lead to safer, not more dangerous communities for us to live in? And if so, how is that possible? That's a really good question that if anybody has a really clear answer on it, they're not just genius, they're probably divine. It's difficult to answer a question about what truly promotes community safety. And you will have people on one hand that will say, well, at least I know while they're incarcerated, that person's not out committing another crime. And they point to the recidivism rates that we have for certain types of offenses. For example, drug addicts are very likely to reoffend if their addiction is not treated, if they're not able to, to deal with that addiction and have some support for dealing with that addiction. And in their reoffending, sometimes it's not just a drug offense. It could be a property crime where they're trying to get money to buy drugs. That's frequently occurs as well. So recidivism is and continues to be a real problem. But when I was in law school, one of the things that I was taught they teach every first year criminal law class to prospective lawyers, they teach you what the goals of incarceration are. Punishment is no doubt a part of that, but also rehabilitation is a part of it and protecting the public. 
is kind of the third big, big part or leg of that. I believe that if you do proper criminal justice reforms, for example, there are people who've been serving in a prison on a 20 year sentence that at year 10 are not gonna get any better. They're not gonna get any more rehabilitated than they are right then because maybe they've done everything that they can do. They've taken every course available to them. They've had time to think and reflect and they decided they don't wanna do this anymore. And so they changed their life, but they may have to stay several more years if they don't get paroled because they, they, that's what their sentence is. We have very incredibly long sentences for offenses in Kentucky. So you look at the question and you try to make a judgment about what can we do that would allow people who have been convicted of an offense to return to the community in a way that is safe for the community, that, that where the community is protected. And that was always one of our goals, for example, in the drug court program. We wanted to make sure that we had eyes on the people that were participating in our programs. And our probation and parole office does that for a number of years. And I can tell you, because I did it myself a lot, many judges are prone to placing people on probation for like five years for the maximum term because they want to keep them accountable to the system because they believe those eyes on give them some motivation not to recidivate, to commit, commit another offense. No one has really got a good answer on that. But I can tell you some things that we are doing, for example, that just got passed in this last legislation that I believe are going to be good and I don't think are gonna unduly increase risk to communities. For example, there was a statute passed on what we call recovery ready communities. If people coming out of prison with addiction problems are going back into the regular community without places where they can go for assistance, without some kind of monitoring and help, the chances are much more likely they're gonna fall back into their old pattern of behavior and recidivate. But if you have communities that are focused on putting people to work, putting people to um, doing those things that help them change the way they live their life, then the community becomes a part of their recovery. And being a part of that recovery also lets you keep eyes on them. So we've worked for years, trying thing after thing, to try to establish what on earth we can do that will really work to return people to the communities and protect the safety of the community. As you know, when they serve out, it's their right to return the community. But while they're in the institution, we offer training and courses to make it better, make them better when they return to the community. And the bottom line is, in the final analysis, you have to hope that there is change within that individual. All you can do is give them the tools to change and hope that they will. So the next question um, you spoke to uh, a bit, but it has a, another part to it. That's the whole situation with COVID and prisoners. And you, you answered a part of that. But the second part of the question that was asked was, uh, what are the future plans to emphasize health issues associated with um, those that are incarcerated? Actually, we have an excellent system of health care for people that are in the institutions. There's some cynicism in the community about how well the health care uh, system is for people that are in our prisons. Is that the thrust of the question? You want to know what we're doing for health while people are in the institutions? Uh, it was part of the question about the, that um, the, co the folks that are in institutions did not have quick access and quick and good priority for um, uh, vaccinations. COVID treatment. Okay, yes. let me talk to you about COVID treatment. Back to those statistics and the other kind of statistics. I don't know who gathered that bit of information that was so negative about the state of Kentucky, but I am not going to stand for it because that is not the case. The state of Kentucky, our institutions have done everything known to man to protect the, the prisoners that we have in our care, that we can within the constraints that we have. We've done everything every other institution has known to do. We began by um, 
you know, at the beginning, all of this, all of the focus on COVID was on contact. You all remember that? They even put out little hooks so you could punch elevator keys and things with that with it. So your hands didn't come into, con into contact with a public area. And there was this information about paper holds it, holds the virus so long, uh, plastic holds it longer, metal holds it longer. We took initial steps the minute that started to do things in the institution with an extreme cleaning schedule, several, as many as five times a day. Because we have the Kentucky Prison Industries, we immediately started manufacturing masks. And I will guarantee you, if Kentucky wasn't the very first, they were one of the first states in the nation that got masks to the prisoners. Now, could you make everybody wear them? Not hardly, but most of them did. We had excellent cooperation with the people in our institutions during this whole period of time. No real unrest about it because they understood the severity of it and they could see what we were trying to do to take care of it. We've, we've done everything from temperature checks on down to the screening. At first, you all will recall, the problem was you couldn't get tests. You couldn't get tests to tell whether it had gotten into the institution. But we were one of the states to get the test kits early, thanks to Governor Bashir and Dr. Stack, seeing that we got them and we began testing. And when we began testing, we started finding COVID. How did it get in? Well, it was brought in from the outside through our work staff. Of course, that's how it got in there. But we stopped visitation. No families have been in these prisons to visit their families, their family member for over a year now. That's about to resume given the current state. We increased their uh, media contacts with family. We gave them free phone calls. We have Zoom chats with family members, but we just didn't allow people, anybody that, that we didn't know who they were to come into the prisons. Even so, we couldn't control what all of our correctional workers did, what our medical workers and food service workers did. And prison did get in our, uh, 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 COVID did get in our prisons. And when it did, because of the size, the, the format, the structure of our prisons, it was a really bad battle. But we fought it and we fought it hard. And you hear all these numbers about how, how bad the mortality rate is in Kentucky's prisons. And I'm gonna say that that is a misnomer as well, because we, there were less than 50 deaths of inmates in our institutions. None of them are acceptable and we grieved every single one of them. We had done everything we could to prevent them. We rotated groups. We fed people in their room. We sent health workers around to their room every day to take temperatures, to check for symptoms of COVID. We took every step known to man that you could do to fight this COVID virus. But in Kentucky, we have some disadvantages. Our old buildings are one. Another is the long sentences, which means that led to an aging population in our prisons. Lengthy sentences, people are there a long time. And then a third factor that everybody has heard about, and that is, of course, Kentucky's not healthy. The people coming into our institutions come in with so many underlying conditions. And we have worked very closely with our medical provider, and they've been very good about it, in providing COVID protection for people in the institutions that has been as effective as we could possibly make it. And we continue to do so. We're about to resume visitation in, in probably about a month. And when we do, we're gonna be very careful. There'll be no direct contact. There will be plexiglass screens between the inmate and family member, no, no physical contact. Uh, again, doing our best to make sure that those that are, are unvaccinated don't spread the condition, the disease to other unvaccinated people. But we now have a very high vaccination rate in our prisons. It's, above, it's right at or above 70%. And that changes on a daily basis because there are people that are serving out and leaving and new people that are coming in. And when they come in, they don't always come in already vaccinated. So we have to get vaccinations to them. But as soon as we could get the number of vaccinations, we started applying them. And I'm very proud of the fact that we have so many people vaccinated now. It was not, um, 
our choice about when the vaccination was prioritized for prisoners, but it was as soon as it could reasonably be done under the directive of the governor and the uh, Center for Disease Control. So sometimes you get a result that no matter what you do, you can't stop. And that has been the case with COVID in Kentucky, but it is not near as bad as people have said. And there's one other thing I'll say about that. We have posted all of our information about COVID on our website. We have reported it. The governor has reported it frequently in his press conferences because it is a mandate of the Bashir administration that we are transparent. I will assure you that is not the case in every other state. And so any group that does a comparison of data from state to state to state is truly looking at apples and oranges and there's not a lot of true value to the statistics they put out. And you might think that's a partisan defense. It's not. It's a defense from somebody who's been there and knows what we've done. Thank you. I'm going to go to a question um, um, here. They're sort of piling up. So let me go over to the chat. A question with the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, et cetera, race-based negative policing so prominent in the news. Is there a panel or commission in Kentucky to study this problem? I personally witnessed a black man forced at gunpoint to crawl on hands and knees around the back of his car and into the grass alongside the road. Racism is real in our police departments. We have taken steps at the Department of Criminal Justice Training that trains local law enforcement and at Kentucky State Police to look at ourselves. We found things we didn't like. We've admitted them, we've pulled them out, and we've corrected them. We are doing training, a, a retraining of all of our state police officers. They're required to take, I believe it's 40 hours of, we're calling it in service, but a big part of that is about cultural diversity and racial issues. It is true that in our prisons, the makeup of our prisons um, is primarily Caucasian, but there is a higher percentage of some minorities in our prison than they reflect in our population. We have the racial makeup in our prisons, for example, is 76.6% Caucasian, 20.5% uh, African-American or black, and that is certainly not the level of population in our state. It is higher, much higher than the level of population. 1.5% um, Hispanic, 0.13% uh, Asian, and 1.2% other, and I'm not sure what the other is. So we do have disproportionality on African-Americans being in institutionalized in our state. This is something that we are aware of, but here's the difficulty. You have to look at not just who we incarcerate or what the numbers are. You also have to look about how we deal with how they got there. And policing is a big part of that as is what happens in defense of criminal defendants and what happens in the court with sentencing. It is a systemic issue that has to be looked at intensely and carefully. We have begun doing that within the department. We're doing diversity training in uh, connection with a diversity officer that's been hired for at the personnel cabinet and with Dr. Aaron uh, Thompson who is the uh, chair of the secondary education department in State Department of Education, who does what he calls um, diversity, community diversity training. And it's, um, it's, it's something that people need to talk about and it's not easy to talk about, it's difficult. But you can't address these problems unless you admit them and discuss them. Whether there is any one single agency that is studying this in the state of Kentucky, I am not aware of one. I don't know whether there is or is not, but I know that there are many local agencies that have begun to study the problem. And I do believe that if we can look at this on a local level, that we'll get tremendous improvement. Karen? We have a question about, um, <clears throat> does Kentucky still have the three strikes law that can result in a 20 year prison term for a third conviction? 
it's not called the three strikes law in Kentucky per se. What we have is the repeat offender statute where uh, with each subsequent offense, uh, there is the possibility of enhancing your sentence. And the answer is yes, we still have that. Is, is it true that, um, I mean, I think this is right. There've been several questions um, that have referred to drug treatment programs and mental health. The system is not there that we need, is that correct? I don't believe that is correct. I think that right now in the state of Kentucky, we have more agencies and companies that are designed to treat substance abuse issues and mental health issues than we can fill, actually. Uh, they've had some business issues with the COVID situation. Some of them have worked with our institutions and they were used to us sending people to them. And we weren't doing that. We weren't sending them out during this and it's been a financial hardship on them. There are many mental health and substance abuse treatment agencies and centers in this state. What we have not had and still probably don't have is a really good and integrated system to get people into them. As a part of studying that problem, one of the things that we do in the institution is that we offer substance abuse treatment programs. We will have, I forget how many, three or four of our prisons, maybe more, that are specialty prisons and have what we call specialty beds, part of that vacancy bed thing, where we send people to that prison to get the substance abuse treatment program. Jails, a number of the jails also run this highly organized, skilled substance abuse treatment program. We also teach a class called moral recognition treatment uh, that teaches people to think about consequences, the morality of what they do. Uh, these together are quite effective in dealing with substance addicted individuals. We do that inside the institution. But I, I think it's fair to say that what happens so often is you don't get the referrals early enough where you can do a really good intervention. And I don't know the answer about how we do that, but I do know that recovery ready communities, this new law that's just passed is very apt to assist with that because local governments will be focusing on recovery issues, which means they'll have to focus on substance abuse issues. And maybe part of that recovery program is identifying people sooner and getting them into the appropriate treatment. Sorry. We had a question about um, the levels of oversight and actually a couple of people have asked about this. What type of oversight, uh, if any, does the, Depart the State Department ha of Corrections have over county jails that house state inmates? That's a really good question too. And it's kind of a conundrum for us. You know, each county that has a jail, it is a county run agency, county run organization, but, and, and they run it the way they decide to run it, except for a few statutes that deal with the state prisoners that are housed in these county jails. The county jails are paid a stipend. I'll be the first to admit it's not enough for housing and dealing with the state prisoners that the statute requires to be housed there. Remember I told you the class D felons and the class C felons with a sentence of five years. That's the minimum on the class C. They have to provide for their medical care. They have to provide for um, education courses and they have to take care of the incarceration and general upkeep, feeding, clothing of the state prisoners that go to the county jails. There are a few statutes that give us oversight on some things, but not on all things, on, every, on anyone who is housed in a county jail. I can say that since I've been secretary, we have had an extremely cooperative relationship with the Kentucky Jailers Association. There are many impressive persons that are running jails in Kentucky. They're interested in doing it the right way, taking proper care of prisoners, and they don't want them to come back. So they're very interested in dealing with re-entry programs as well. There are some things that we can do. For example, if a jail is not safe, the uh, Justice Cabinet 
has the ability and the authority to shut down a jail. And we almost did th that this past year because there was a fire safety issue. It was ameliorated and we were able to go forward. But that's only for extreme safety issues that have to be certified by inspection agencies that we can actually do that. We can also say um, pretty much a yes or a no about whether prisoners that are housed in uh, local jails can be put on work details. They can be taken out for work. You'd be surprised to know, I suspect some of you would, because I certainly was, that so many of the county governor governments around the state really rely on um, state prisoners that are housed in county jails to do their public maintenance and upkeep, to do a number of jobs for them that they can pay a very uh, minimal wage for, that if they had to replace with civilian workers would cost them many, many, many thousands of dollars more to the local county government. We stopped that during COVID and they've been most anxious for us to resume it. So we have required the presentation of a protocol for that describes what they'll do for the safety of our state inmates that they're housing uh, before they can return to work details. Personally, I think going out and working and doing a job is better than just sitting in jail twiddling your thumbs. So I have been encouraging uh, programs that are safe and good and that provide community service. What better thing could you do if you're in, incarcerated in a community than go out and do something that's helpful to that community like mow the roadways? So these, these I think are very good things to have happen. Uh, Secretary, we've got some uh, several more questions. Would you be willing to go to 815 on this discussion? Sure, I can. Okay, um, we'll try to get through these then and if everybody will uh, you know, stay with us until 815, then we'll wrap up. Um, I've got a question. So often over the years when people would propose improvements in the criminal justice system or changes, people were told there's no money. You know, we don't have the money to do this. With the money that's coming out of the relief plan, federal relief plan, are there dollars available for criminal justice system to do some innovative things maybe, or to fill some holes? There may be some. Let me explain about that federal money. It is much more tailored and tagged on what you can spend it on than people think. It is not a blank check and it's not freely spent. For example, I can give you an example. There was $37 million was placed in the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet budget that ended up in the general administrative budget of the governor. That $37 million is tagged by federals, by, by, by the feds, to be spent on COVID prevention programs. So that's all you can spend it on is a COVID prevention program. And so you have to get creative and think about how do you use that? How do you spend it on COVID prevention in the jails and in the prisons? Well, I'm sure we can come up with some ways. One of the things that we did in the jails this, I'm sorry, in the prisons this past year is, you know, we're willing to try innovative things. There is a new program of wastewater analysis and treatment that will let you know um, what types of viruses, particularly COVID, is present in that wastewater that gives you an, an early heads up about what you might need to do to isolate and to test and to move around and change within the institution. So things of that nature probably are supportable. But when you're talking about general uh, criminal justice reform, my answer is gonna have to be, it depends on the limitations that are placed on the funds. But I do believe that there is some intent for a, a good portion of that money to be directed toward things that we are doing. I'm hopeful, you're, you're always hopeful that the money can be directed toward, uh, I'm gonna use the word and I don't mean it in a political sense, a progressive program that will look forward to things that you need to do to change treatment modalities and how you sentence and, and carry things out. There have been several questions um, as a follow-up to the discussion about um, systemic racism and how to address it in terms of training. 
Um, one of the one of the issues that went around on social media was that some of the training itself um, appeared to be very racist. I don't know if you saw that, but um, I know a number of us did that the training materials uh, appear to be racist. There also is a related question that what you can train officers, but what happens when um, they don't comply with the training or they don't carry out their duties in such a way that the training has um, uh, prepared them for? How, how is it enforced that they carry out the um, um, policies concerning racial justice? First, let me say that I am painfully aware of those training materials issues. And for all except one thing, they were older versions of training materials, not current training materials. Nonetheless, they should never have been in Kentucky State Police training or Department of Criminal Justice training. And we have eradicated them. That's what I said. You know, if you discover a problem, don't deny it, admit that it's a problem and then correct it and make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's what we're doing with the training materials. We have reviewed, my cabinet reviewed 20 years worth of state police training materials. And we found things in there that probably wouldn't have been on anybody's radar at the time that certainly are on our radar now. And that's what we have to do. We have to find them. We have to say, this is now, and that's this is what's appropriate or not appropriate for where we are. Some of those things were never appropriate. They've been removed and we're not gonna allow that kind of thing going forward. We are re-educating, like I said, with the, the trainings. One of the trainings that we're doing that I think is incredibly helpful that comes out of the incident with the Department of Criminal Justice training is that the leadership at DOCJT and at the Kentucky State Police have contracted with the um, Holocaust Museum in DC they put on an excellent training program. I think some uh, local police departments are trying to get that training as well on um, matters related to um, Jewish faith issues. And we're doing the same thing in every area where we find that we might have a weakness or a deficiency because the population in Kentucky now does pretty much reflect the world. Maybe not so much in our rural areas, but definitely in our cities and towns. And so we have to be aware of who our citizens are and what we should do toward accepting them. Particularly, I know the governor feels this way, I feel this way, particularly law enforcement has got to be beyond these kinds of issues. And you ask me what would happen if they didn't follow the training directives that we had? We will change this, this approach. We will change this. And just this year, the legislature passed a statute that is excellent. It's a change in the law that allows the uh, Kentucky Law Enforcement Council to withdraw the certification of any law enforcement officer that has been convicted of a crime. We didn't actually have that until that statute was passed this year. So with that, I think you will see more prosecutions for improper conduct, uh, more prosecutions for hate crimes. And if someone is gonna perform that way, and that is what we determine has happened, they will not stay in our agencies, not in the state police. And we're not training to that in the, at the, the Department of Criminal Justice training. Every place has to have a beginning point. It's incredible that after hundreds of years, we say we're at a beginning point, but we are. There comes a time when you have to start. If you haven't done it, anytime you start doing it, it's a start. So we have started now to focus on the, the racial inequities that we see. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's a cultural change. It's not just what our police departments do. It's what mothers and fathers teach their children. That's incredibly important. And until we can change the mindset of the majority of us, it's going to remain a difficult issue. But know that this administration is working on it. Okay, here's one from uh, the uh, Q&A. 
Um, according to the Kentucky Policy Organization, Kentucky also needs to do more through administrative response and legislation to reverse the increase of the incarcerated population. What can the citizens of Kentucky do to affect the change to affect change in our prison system? What can you do as secretary of the cabinet to change and improve our system? You know, criminal statutes are enacted by the legislature. The legislature sets the penalty. Judges sentence according to the prescribed penalties. The person that is incarcerated and they become ours to take care of until they serve out or are otherwise released. I can't shorten anybody's sentence. That's not within the power of the cabinet. The only way we can shorten sentences would be for a review of the sentencing structure in Kentucky done by the legislature and a consideration of whether or not what needs to be shortened. And there's some, I believe, probably do. But the other side of that coin are the people who say that question we got earlier. What about protecting me? What about protecting the community? And what about punishing wrongdoers? There are some people who believe strongly in punishment. So there is a competitive, there are competitive interests here that it's incredibly difficult, I won't lie to you about it, it's incredibly difficult to find that middle path that can address both of those issues appropriately. We continue to work, for example, I, I have worked with the past couple of legislative sessions, legislators who want to work on the bail issue where the bond is set on folks at such a high level that they can't bond out when they haven't been convicted of a crime yet. We think that there are some things that have happened this past year that will address that matter. President uh, Stivers of the Senate is proposing um, a plan. I don't know how, it's just in the formative stages where at least for those who are um, sitting in pretrial that are substance uh, addicted, that they go immediately into substance abuse treatment programs before they're ever tried and sentenced as a kind of a diversion plan. It would take a legislative change to make that happen, but we can make that happen if the legislature decides to do it. What we as administrators can do is advocate for that kind of change. And uh, we have done it. Governor Bashir came into this office saying that criminal justice reform was important and it had to be reform that was common sense and that kept punishments adequate to the offenses. You know, he is a prosecutor. He's gonna be very sure that we do things appropriately. You keep punishment adequate to the offenses, but you don't punish just for punishment's sake. And you know, uh, some of these programs like drug courts and others have gotten a lot more attractive to folks when they realize how much it costs to keep people in prison. And when you have to pay with taxpayer dollars, the millions and millions of dollars we have to pay to house people in our institutions, then everybody starts thinking, is there another way? Is there a middle ground? What can we do? We just have to keep working at it. What, um, what does it cost to keep, and we have had this question submitted, what does it cost to keep a prisoner incarcerated a day? You know, I really should know that, and I don't have the current number on it. The number has fluctuated considerably um, over the past year because of increased medical cost, as you might imagine. And uh, it's something that we could get and send to your organization that you could put on your website. I don't know the answer to that right now today. That's fine. I think we're going to have to respond to some people after this program's over because <laughs> we had so many questions. Uh, Karen, you've got one? Yes, um, I'm just going to read this because it's a it's a complex question, but it, I think it's a good question. In a 2017 Herald Leader report, Kentucky is paying imprisoned people an average of just nine cents an hour for labor. The, in, the inmates are, are forced to work for the state, and the rate Kentucky is paying this is one ninetieth the rate of the minimum wage. Many criminal justice advocates have compared this type of labor to modern day slavery. Prisoners pay higher fees to stay in touch with their family and their friends and to purchase items from the commissary. Uh, what is your cabinet, what concerns does the cabinet have about this disparity? 
the work that prisoners do is, is of the nature that I described to you in the county jails. They go out and do county work. The jails make those contracts. They get paid X amount of money that goes into their personal accounts. Um, some of the prisoners in the institutions also go out. We've got a couple of facilities that are doing what I think are very innovative things where the prisoners actually work at industries. And we have a new program at, uh, in Eastern Kentucky that is gonna be a model, I think, for the nation. They call it a pie program, but what it really is, it's a program that a corporate uh, agency has come in and built an institution next to one of our prisons. And they are going to train highly skilled workers that can be paid $25, $35 an hour to do that kind of work. We are working on it. I'll tell you that it is a historical fact that prisoners are not paid ordinary wage and there's no law that requires that they be. I will also say that it, no one's made to do it. It's very competitive for those people that want those jobs that are available because it's a way for them to get money into the prison accounts. Okay, we're approaching the end time yes, and are. I'd like to just make a couple of comments. First of all, thank you so much, Secretary Noble. We really appreciate all of the information that you've given us tonight. And for those of you who didn't get your comment responded to or your question answered, we'll, keep, we'll be in touch with you through email and work with the cabinet to get, your, get responses to you. Um, I'd like to make a, a special announcement. Twin PAC um, is, the, is, is a public or excuse me, political action uh, committee that's connected to a twin. And there's a special event coming up on July 23rd in Lexington. We will be having a, a major event and the speaker is going to be Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett of the Virgin Islands, one of the lead prosecutors in the second Trump impeachment trial. Um, she was pretty impressive on that floor and I think she'll be really interesting as a speaker. So mark that date, uh, July 23rd in Lexington and we'll send you more information. We encourage you to check out the websites of the organizations that have been involved tonight and you'll find the criminal justice report on the Women's Network website if you wanna look at it in detail. Um, likewise, check out the activities on Together Frankfurt's website, Moms Demand Action and Four. Thank you so much, all of you, for sticking with us, for attending, and um, for your wonderful questions and comments. And we will be in touch to make sure that those all get answered. And Secretary Noble, thank you again so very much for your thank time. You.